And uh, I hope you're in enjoyment of this wonderful feast that we're having. And uh, now you are officially locavores, which is a new per term that I learned during this process, the locavore, those who dine locally. And um, I want to thank, again, all of our friends and colleagues from the Institute, from the University of Notre Dame, but also our uh, colleagues from Indiana University South Bend who are here and St. Mary's College. Thank you for making the long trek. We thank our local businesses and restaurateurs in particular, the nonprofits and the community organizations that are represented, represented here as well as the regional businesses in Michiana and Chicago and of course from Europe. Before we hear a few marks about how Notre Dame fits into the topic of today's symposium, I'm going to recognize and thank a few people who've been profoundly helpful in making this possible. Um, Giulio Minato, let's see, where is he? There he is. Um, thank you for being here. He is representing our generous sponsor, the European Union delegation to the United States in Washington, D.C. And um, also his colleagues, Constant Whiteside and Mark Pito from the EU delegation, who have been uh, helping us for almost a year putting this together. So we're very, very happy about that. Then Mayor P uh, Pete Buttigieg, the mayor of South Bend, who again has been uh, uh, a, a collaborator and an inspiration for us uh, from the beginning of the project. We're uh, so happy that you can be here. And to all of our speakers, uh, including the ones who will be speaking remotely. Thanks, we're so happy that you're participating. Harriet Baldwin and Lori Roberts from the Office of Academic Conferences are here and uh, our usually uh, uh, indefatigable Nanovic Institute staff have all pitched in to make the logistics happen the way that they happen so well here. Thank you so much. So every year, the Nanovic Institute sends about 100 students to Europe for various projects. They go over their fall break, their spring break for longer immersions and sometimes assistance for a whole semester or even a year. When they come back, um, we hear a lot of different feedback, some of it quite interesting, but no one ever complains about the food. <laughs> and in fact, you rarely hear complaints about the food from the dining hall, which is uh, actually, you may recall from your own autobiography, a kind of leitmotif of student life, complaining about the mystery meat and, and you know, how dry I am and, and all that. But that is not the case with our students. We have a tradition of excellent food to sustain them in their, their minds and their bodies, uh, perhaps because the university was founded by the French not the Irish, <laughs> but I think it also has to do, pardon me, <laughs> I think it also has to do with the commitment and the, the knowledge that is brought to the uh, really enormous, incomprehensibly enormous task of feeding this army of hungry students. And at the same time, while accomplishing that, on, uh, on a basis that is nutritious and efficient to practice a commitment to local businesses, local agriculture and producers to the extent that's possible to bring this, this huge quantity of produce into the campus every single day of the year. I'm thinking, I have an image of uh, Paris in the 19th century and all of the carts and wagons mounded with food and animal carcasses all coming into Le Al in the middle of the night to be processed and distributed through the city. I don't think we have a Le Al at Notre Dame, so I'm not aware of it. I don't even want to be aware of it. But uh, that is the, the uh, level of food that is processed here and that is supervised from start to finish by our chef. Please welcome the executive chef, Don Miller. Well, good afternoon. Um, as Donald said, my name is Donald, and uh, 
and I'm happy to be here. And I'd just like to take a minute and explain to you how I got here in, on, at the podium today. And I had received a phone call, I believe it was from Anthony or, or, and Donald, um, and uh, they invited me to their office, this is a, a number of months ago, and uh, discussed the possibility of doing this summit. And, and their concern was with um, serving food that was sustainable and it had thought in it at, in terms of where we sourced it, how we sourced it, and, and uh, all of the issues involved. And <clears throat> we got to talking, and uh, unfortunately, I think I talked a little bit too much, and they asked me if I would come speak at the luncheon. So <laughs> that's how I got here. <clears throat> so you'll have to bear with me. Um, I want to start by <clears throat> talking about um, the menu. And, um, and we'll do this at a course at a time. And uh, the salad was uh, a salad greens with heirloom tomatoes, toasted pecans, and fresh herbs served with a honey citrus vinaigrette. We get all our, uh, we've got all our produce for today's luncheon at McQuethy's uh, Hydroponic Farms, which is in Three Oaks, Michigan. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's not very far away from here. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing facility <clears throat> that has expanded actually since the last time I was there. And they do um, a lot of wonderful things that uh, I'm gonna t talk about in a minute. Our poultry came from uh, outside of Goshen, Indiana, <clears throat> which isn't that far from here either, uh, at, at a farm, um, the farmer's name is Galen Miller. And the poultry is, uh, uh, is a free range antibiotic free poultry. Um, and then uh, our meat came from Adam Moody, and that's Moody Meats in Indianapolis. Anybody that's familiar with Indianapolis will know that <clears throat> there are Moody Meats butcher shops throughout Indianapolis downtown and in the suburbs. And this is a gentleman who I met um, working with the Indiana Department of Agriculture on, on trying to develop some local sourcing and he was very involved from a producer's uh, point of view and very active in the state of Indiana. And uh, I went down there and visited his property a number of years ago and we became fairly good friends and we communicate with each other often. And uh, of course I told him about the event today and he provided us with the tri-tips. Um, which uh, his, the name of his farm in Indianapolis, uh, outside Indianapolis is Lone Pine Farms. <clears throat> and he provided the uh, tri-tips and uh, of course we marinated them and char grilled them and, and served them to you in that fashion. And then, um, then our um, perch came from um, Bell Aquaculture, and, um, which is in Albany, Indiana. And I'm gonna, uh, discuss that a little bit more in a minute. So, um, the challenges. <clears throat> and the challenges I speak to aren't about today's dinner, but about producing 15 to 20,000 meals daily. And I tell my colleagues around the country when they know that I'm from the University of Notre Dame, they say, oh, you're from South, you're in South Bend, Indiana. And I say, no, actually I'm Notre Dame, Indiana. And, I t and so I got to thinking about that over the course of years, and I b began to use the line that I think I'm the only chef that I know <laughs> that is the executive chef of a city. And so I use that. <laughs> and at 15 to 20,000 meals a day, uh, I, I actually, I am, I suppose. And it, and it brings on all sorts of uh, challenges that I'm just gonna touch on a, a little bit of it. So, um, <clears throat> And you'll see we have uh, difficult to determine local. Well, when and we started uh, really focusing on local sustainability and sourcing in 2007. So this has been a, 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 a journey for us over a course of a number of years now. And <clears throat> we started by trying to, we have over 10,000 items on inventory. And so we, we began by auditing our food. Well, where did it come from? And that's really how we started. And the, the challenge was a lot of food, we had difficulty really knowing where it came from, the actual source, which is a challenge when you're not purchasing locally. And, 
And uh, so th that took quite a, quite a while to achieve that, um, and to the point where we can tell you where everything comes from now at the university. Every, every food item that we purchase, we uh, in many cases have been to the facilities and visited them and met the owners and the, the, the people that work there. Um, another challenge uh, with uh, producing and serving and having available uh, locally produced foods is finding the sources for it, especially for the volume that we do. <clears throat> we do, uh, I can tell you, we do a better job locally sourcing our, uh, some of our operations as opposed to others. The dining halls are very difficult because of the volume we do. That doesn't mean that we don't have locally uh, sourced foods, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of those as we go along. But uh, it, is, it is a challenge. Uh, you know, you can't just quite simply go to the local farmer and ask for uh, 3,000 chickens for Tuesday afternoon. That's just not going to happen. Um, <coughs> then uh, uh, our student perception of quality is a another challenge. And I want to share with you a little story. We were buying <coughs> Washington apples for years. And of course, the Washington apples are perfect. They're beautiful, they're, they are, they're, there is not a flaw in them, and one has to begin to wonder how they get that way. So we switched and committed in 2007, I believe it was, or 2008, to start purchasing Michigan apples. Well, <clears throat> the Michigan apples don't look perfect, but we just changed and put them in the, in the residential dining halls, and um, the students stopped taking them. And so we had a problem with that, and we had to meet and go, well, what's going on? Actually, I ate the apples. I, they certainly tasted better, but visually they did not look as, as nice. And so what we did, we just, you know, a little uh, thought, and we put up posters saying, hey, these are locally sourced Michigan apples 10 miles up the road. Bam, that's all it took. And, and so we, along the way, we've learned to un, uh, and, uh, that, and understand that education every step of the way is so critically important to uh, achieving the goal of trying to uh, produce or, uh, food uh, from locally sources. So, uh, another challenge is it's not always cost effective. Um, in many cases, in, in conferences and in retail, we can pass on the cost, but we have a given plate cost for the students, and that, of course, is where the bulk of our meals come. We serve over 15,000 meals a day just to the students. And so the challenge is we have a plate cost. There's not a, a revenue per se. And so that is a challenge for us, and there are many items that we would like to put on there, but we, we can't in order to be fiscally responsible. <clears throat> and then a limited range of products. And, and what I mean by a limited range of products, <clears throat> when local produce is available uh, in season, the students, first of all, aren't even here. They're gone for the summer. And um, the variety of what we can get is a challenge then when we go into the school year. So it's very limited. Um, our successes, I have some notes around here somewhere that I have to um, <clears throat> talk about. Uh, Notre Dame spends annually over a quarter of a million dollars on local produce, and that represents, or local products, excuse me, which, and that represents 26% uh, of our entire purchases of goods. Uh, our own heightened awareness of where our food is coming from um, has been a value as we've moved forward with, with uh, purchasing locally. We've, uh, we have had to research and study and look for the locations and the sources where we purchase our food. And so we've all become, all of us, the, the, the managers, the administration, the cooks, all the way down the line, have, have a, a new heightened awareness of where our food is coming from. That didn't exist before, so that, I think that's important. Um, since the spring, uh, how did we get, get to this, um, uh, um, to the point that we're at now? We purchased 17% of all our produce is purchased locally. 
we feel that's a good number, given the fact that, that um, it, we are very seasonal up here. And when the produce is in season, the students are gone. Um, and uh, we had to decide how we were going to achieve even getting 17%. And we looked at a lot of models of universities around the country. And the, the universities and the colleges that were successful with um, buying local food and sustainable food um, were smaller, smaller schools and universities. And the farmers would quite simply just bring the pickup trucks to the loading dock and uh, they'd unload for them. Well, we couldn't do that. So we had to uh, join a partnership with a purveyor. Fortunately, in South Bend, we do have a local home uh, uh, distributor named Stan's Food Services, and we met with them and, and, and discussed our issues, and, and, uh, and they were made aware that there's no way that we can, we can have 40, 50 pickup trucks daily come into the loading docks. So um, um, Michigan, the state of Michigan has an ideal uh, farming culture in which they have co-ops. And of course, the farmers take their product to the co-ops, and then uh, our distributor stands uh, worked it out where they went and picked them up. And we keep track of it. Uh, last year, we bought from 176 different local farms, and, and that's how we achieved our 17%. We couldn't have done that without partnering, partnering with our food distributor. So we are fortunate in respect to that. Okay. Um, we have uh, taken a great deal of time and gone out to the local farms. Uh, many of you may or may not know that Berrien Springs County, which is just north of uh, St. Joe County in Michigan, the next county up, is the number one county in the United States of diversified crops when they're in season. And you think about it, they've got grapes, they've got fruit, they've got produce, they've got vegetables, they've got, they've got everything. And so um, if, uh, we uh, began to um, explore that. We went up there, they're close, and we've made a lot of great relationships with farmers. Uh, we uh, began, we wanted to try to keep it within the state of Indiana. It really didn't make sense when uh, uh, Berrien County is just five miles up the road and Indianapolis is 130 miles down the road. So. Um, so we went in, in that uh, direction. Okay. And um, this is one of the local farmers up there, and he produces vegetables and fruit. What's interesting about this, he's not an organic farmer, and uh, he does use some pesticides. He produces for baby food companies. And I can tell you, you know, in going and looking at the fields, that they have more controls and tighter books than any organic farm I've been on. And everything is metered, including the water. And there are records on it, and it's very detailed. And um, you know, as, as a conscientious decision, we uh, built a relationship with this farmer and uh, get a lot of our local produce directly from him during the, during the course of the season. Um, switching over to uh, seafood, um, the University of Notre Dame was the first university in the United States to uh, become Marine Stewardship Council chain of custody certified in wildlife seafood. We felt it was important um, that um, we uh, we wanted to um, have a um, uh, uh, we we wanted to um, have a a successful endeavor in, 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 in trying to do the right thing with wildlife and, you know, in talking with a lot of people like, oh yeah, we, we, we buy, you know, what the Monterey uh, Aquarium uh, tell us is sustainable and all that. And, and um, of course that misses a lot of the issues. And, um, and uh, so we um, became certified in 2008 and what that means is that we can tell you um, every uh, wildlife seafood uh, that we purchase, where it was caught, when it was caught, by whom it was caught, where it was processed, whom processed it, where the distributor that picked it up, um, when they picked it up, who picked it up, and how it was delivered to us, 
And when it comes to our door, we're responsible for, um, for um, knowing how much we're bringing in, how we're storing it, how we're issuing it, and, and then controlling the, the, the uh, usage of it. In the retail, we have, of course, a point of sale system. In the dining hall, we use our, our forecasting system and our food management system. And so, we, and, and so we know exactly how much we bring in, how much we sell, which is important because we get surprised on it once a year. And they come in and they ask for a date range. We have to give it to them right on the spot. And, and, uh, and uh, the data of how much we've used, how much we purchased, how much we use within that period of time. Um, so, I talked a little bit about culinary education, and you know, part of food is having respect for food. And um, um, you know, as a chef walking through the kitchens, and you can imagine, and I'm going to put up at the end the kind of volume of some of the things we go through, which is, which is unbelievable. But, um, <clears throat> you know, there's two ways to do everything, the right way and the wrong way. And I'm going to use strawberries as an example. And going through some of the, the uh, kitchens, the high volume kitchens, um, at, at times I used to see our em employees taking the strawberries and just cutting the end off. Okay? Quarter of an ounce, half an ounce sometimes. Um, and, uh, and I started looking at how many strawberries we went through a year and multiplying it by that little bit of waste as opposed to just taking the strawberry with a paring knife and pulling the stem off and showed them that we could save $8,000 a year just by doing that. So, so that was a, a, an a appreciation uh, for the food. I don't know that they quite got it, so I tried something different. I took out our, our we have a, a apprenticeship program here, a culinary apprenticeship program. So I took the apprentices out in the field, they had to pick a flat of strawberries. And I can tell you, you'll, you'll get respect for food real quick. <laughs> It's a little easier picking a flat of strawberries at the grocery store in one spot as opposed to on your knees in the field uh, in hot weather pulling a flat of strawberries. So I think that the message got through and I'm happy to say that we pull all our stems off our strawberries now and consequently we've saved the university some money in doing that and also giving respect to our, to our, um, to our foods. This is just, uh, these are some of the, just uh, to give you an idea uh, of the, some of the top items that we go through in produce a year. And this was 2012, our last uh, fiscal year, full fiscal year. And you can see, we went over, uh, 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 well, you can see the numbers. I mean, uh, they're amazing. Uh, an interesting story behind this, and I can't remember if I have it in a slide or not, and so I'm kind of not jiving with my slides, and you'll have to bear with me, but you also have to remember I'm a chef. But um, <coughs> we uh, formed an alliance with uh, some of the major universities in Indiana, and we put the statistics of those universities together, and they were Purdue, Ball State, Indiana Bloomington, and Indiana State, and I think that's it, and us. And of course, uh, many of those universities I talked about have larger feeding uh, facilities and feed more people, and the numbers just multiplied and compounded. We were doing way over a million pounds of leafy lettuces, and, and it was an amazing thing. Um, and that goes to a, a, a story I don't know that I'll get into here, but anybody that's interested on the side in, in, in our um, discussions with the Department of Agriculture of Indiana um, in trying to influence them into having some kind of uh, local uh, produce program and meat program uh, al alignment with universities. And when we put those numbers together and gave them to them, they, they uh, gave it um, consideration, but I'm sorry to say that uh, not much has been done about that since. I, I did learn at the time, though, that I didn't realize that uh, and this was two years, three years ago, and at that time, uh, there was, we had only had a Secretary of Agriculture for less than five years, ever, in the state of Indiana. And I, I didn't know that, and I found that amazing, and I asked them, well, why, why is that? And they go, well, we're an industrial farm state, and, and uh, our crops are, actually the number one crop in Indiana is forestry, which I, I, I didn't 
uh, didn't believe in. And then it's uh, corn and soybeans. And so I found that interesting. So their focus uh, back then uh, and still, uh, it was not on developing a, a real strong um, uh, farm to school program. Um, and in fact, I have their uh, 2025 uh, Indiana Department of Ag Agriculture uh, uh, strategic plan, and nowhere in there does it discuss it at all. So we kind of gave up, and we, um, we do buy some uh, wonderful things from Indiana. Um, uh, um, and I, the, the ones I mentioned, of course, and others. Um, so that's where I'm at. So I'm open for questions. I apologize if I kind of randomly went around this, but uh, Donald, uh, yes, sir. Could you uh, tell us about the relationship with Bell Aquaculture? Okay, thank you. I think that's local. Good. Thank you, Will, for that question. Um, a number of years ago, maybe two or three years ago, Norm, um, Bell Agriculture is um, a phenomenal aquaculture farm in Albany, Indiana. And I was invited down there to a, um, a uh, summit, and they brought in scientists from around the world. And I, I went down there, I had no idea what I was going to, and I was amazed. And, uh, and uh, the, 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 the scientific uh, facilities at, uh, at uh, Bell Perch are like walking into the future. It was unbelievable. And they had uh, technicians that just dealt with the aquifying systems there from around the world. And, and, uh, and from the University of Wisconsin, I think it was a big player in all that, as I recall. But here's an interesting thing that really stuck in my mind. And they told us this there, and we talked about it last night. Um, and of course, the Great Lakes and the sustainability of fish in the Great Lakes is a big issue. And, um, and of course, perch, as we knew it back in the 50s and 60s, if you were uh, 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 living in the Midwest or around the Great Lakes, is a totally different perch than you'll find in most restaurants uh, that sell perch. And the yellowtail perch is the true um, indigenous perch to the, the, lake, the, to the Great Lakes. And that's what Bell um, uh, aquaculture produces. But um, uh, the statistics, um, are that in the Great Lakes um, there are, uh, I believe it's 780,000 square surface miles of water of all the Great Lakes. And of course one square surface mile is 640 acres. Bell, and I, I, Norm, I don't want to steal any thunder or anything like that, but um, Bell um, uh, Aquaculture, I believe is on 36 acres of land or 38 acres, something like that. And in 2016 they're going to produce more perch than the entire Great Lakes combined on a farm that isn't even using those 38 acres right now, currently. And it was amazing. And uh, they've developed a, uh, a soybean feed specifically for perch, and I don't know the details, but I, I, I know good food when I taste it, obviously. This is a, a um, part of the job. But um, the perch was incredible and is incredible. I served it today. I probably didn't do it as much justice as it is when it's there and, and, and you can get it as fresh as, as you possibly can. Um, but um, it, uh, it's an amazing facility. Um, we serve it here on campus in our retail operations and on occasion in the dining halls. It's a wonderful product. Um, when you're out at the restaurants and you're ordering perch, ask if it's yellowtail. Okay, so that's interesting. But it, uh, I found that to be fascinating and interesting. So, Will, thank you for the question. So, yes? What happens to your food waste? That's a good question. We have a centralized food service support facility north of campus, and uh, we have uh, a vegetable processing facility in there. And all the, the, the vegetable ends and products and all that go to a local farmer and uh, a cattle farmer, and he t takes every bit that we, that we have. Uh, hopefully we're not, we don't have a lot to give, but um, you know, there are, there are trim in, in, in vegetables. With respect to the waste from uh, consumption, um, and uh, we've done uh, studies with the students and have done uh, um, uh, awarenesses with um, plate uh, um, waste. And uh, at one time we, um, I, I, I don't know the, 
the, the dates exactly, but I believe it was about two, year ago, two years ago we started, uh, we started tracking it and we were getting about 5.8% um, uh, waste on the plate. And we've reduced that down to, uh, right now currently it's about 3%, 3.5%. So um, we have issues and challenges with that. The nature of the dining rooms at South are such that the serveries to the dining hall are quite a walking distance and some of the uh, newer uh, food service facilities, the actual uh, tables for eating are right within the servery. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that is because we looked at going trayless, like a lot of universities, we couldn't do that because of the logistics. What we did do was reduce the size of the trays. Um, and uh, so we, we take a look at each of the challenges. We may not be able to fulfill it the way we want to, but somehow we, we come to uh, a workable uh, medium on it, so. And what about the, the post-consumption waste? Is that all just trash or? Um, we, um, we, have, um, we don't have pulpers. But our, our water processing plant is just over here, and that works out really well. We actually pulp our food um, using food processors, big commercial food processors, and run it right to the water filtering plant uh, on St. Joe River. Yes? Uh, I'm sorry if I missed it, but what is your definition of local? Our definition of local, that's a good question. Today's local is within about 50 miles, and I can tell you, um, and I know I'm probably getting told that over uh, speaking too long, but Pay no attention to me. Um, um, uh, like our potatoes came from White Pigeon, Michigan, and and before World War II, of course, all potatoes or a good amount of the potatoes came from Michigan. Michigan was known for their potatoes. Now it's Idaho, but um, uh, but we we got them in, in White Pigeon. But our definition to get right to the point, and we had to come up with something, so we're more of a regional. It's the state of Indiana and every state that touches Indiana. But we use the dartboard method. And for those of you that aren't, aren't aware of what that is, is we find the closest source we can, and then we keep trying to get closer. And an example of that are the potatoes. We were buying them from Idaho. Then we started sourcing them from Minnesota. And then this beautiful, wonderful plant in White Pigeon, Michigan, which is just 30 miles up the road on, on 80 there, uh, built a, po a potato processing facility and the Michigan starting to come back and produce more potatoes to offset some of their, their uh, woes, if you will. And, um, and so we found that's so we got closer. So we're looking at everything like that. Um, uh, we, we, we try to get as close as we can. We're not satisfied with that. And when, um, and when we can find sources that are closer, we, we jump on that. Well, Chef, thanks okay. again for yep. this wonderful piece. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, also for enlightening us on the fact that um, not only are you providing the sustenance for those being educated, but you're also providing a, a culinary education and so the students are aware of where the food comes from and what some of the issues are. I think that uh, in fact, one of the things that our symposium marks today is uh, a, a trend that I see as merging interests in food and consumption and, um, uh, and academia in general. Not only in the kinds of areas that one might expect, but also in, say, the, the arts and humanities. And I was prompted by this when um, my uh, wife and fellow professor, Susan Omer over there, brought home this book, which is brand new, from the <coughs> Notre Dame University Press, uh, called Savoring Power, Consuming the Times, The Metaphors of Food in Medieval and Renaissance Italian Literature by Pina Palma. And this, uh, in fact, is um, uh, a remarkable trend that's happening right now, where um, in addition to, say, the, the sociology of uh, artistic production or thought or the, the humanities, the physical circumstances of those times are being taken into consideration. So um, speaking of more consumption, um, we have some local ice cream and, and some local rhubarb pie over there for you, and some not very local coffee also. <laughs> so thanks again. And the symposium will begin promptly at 1.30. So.
Don't hesitate.